Hello everyone and welcome to Teach Me in 10, the video series brought to you by LabTube, part of the Technology Networks Group, where we ask scientists to describe their research area or a scientific concept in less than 10 minutes. My name is Rue McKenzie and I'm a senior science writer at Technology Networks and today I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Lisa Montegia from Vanderbilt University. Now, Lisa's lab focuses on the molecular and cellular mechanisms underlying psychiatric disease. On today's Teach Me in 10, however, She's going to explain to us recent research she conducted on how the psychedelic drug ketamine works as a rapid acting antidepressant in the brain in just 10 minutes. Over to you, Lisa. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So my lab uh, has been interested in how antidepressants work. And so when I started my lab, we were really focused on, again, how do antidepressants work? We know everyone knows somebody that's depressed or takes an antidepressant. And we've seen the cartoons on TV where you have a little nerve cell pumping out serotonin. And the idea is that when you're depressed, there's less serotonin and antidepressants increase serotonin. So we started off really looking at this and we do know it's true that typical FDA approved antidepressants do increase serotonin, but there's little data that depression is necessarily less serotonin. And what's interesting is that even though antidepressant drugs increase serotonin very quickly, it typically takes a couple of weeks to exert an antidepressant effect. So as we were studying this, clinical work came out on ketamine. And ketamine is a very different type of drug, as you know. Um, it is an NMDA receptor blocker. And what that means is it blocks glutamate transmission. It's not involved directly with serotonin. Ketamine, as most people have heard, at very high doses can be an anesthetic. At more mid-level doses, it can trigger psychomimetic effects. But what was found is that at extremely, extremely low doses, if you infuse ketamine over 30 minutes in patients, patients even that are treatment resistant that haven't responded to traditional antidepressants, you can get a rapid antidepressant effect within a couple of hours. And it was really remarkable. So we became interested in ketamine for two reasons. And I think the reasons are important. The first was ketamine demonstrated that pharmacologically with a drug, you could exert a rapid antidepressant effect, which was previously unknown. Everyone had hypothesized that antidepressants just take weeks to work, but now we know that you can do it very quickly. And secondly, ketamine blocks this glutamate receptor, this NMDA receptor. And the fact that it happens so quickly, could we actually try to put together a point-by-point -point pathway of how you trigger an antidepressant effect? It's very difficult when you study drugs like um, Prozac or well that target monoaminergic or serotonin transmission because you have to take them for several weeks. So there's many changes that can occur, but how do you put that in a pathway? But the fact that ketamine does it so quickly, we thought was really interesting. So what we've done over the years is we've actually put forth a hypothesis, a testable hypothesis of how you block, ketamine blocks these NMDA receptors and works through this pathway where it actually triggers, and this was rather surprising, a form of plasticity in the brain. So there you have a sort of molecular cascade that then causes functional changes in the brain. Um, we're measuring this by electrophysiology or really how synapses, the point of neuronal communication occurs. And what we could show is that we have a pathway. And if you interfere with anything in this pathway, at least with animals, we don't see antidepressant effects. And if you can actually activate this pathway, we could trigger rapid antidepressant effects. But again, the surprising feature was as we were studying this, again, how do you get this rapid antidepressant effect? And not only rapid, but ketamine, when you give it to patients has this rapid effect that in some patients can last for days or maybe even more than a week later, which is remarkable for a drug that is cleared from your body very quickly. So if you're having antidepressant effects with ketamine for several days, it's not that ketamine is still there and blocking this receptor. It's cleared your body. So it has to be producing changes in some way. So in work that we've done, we actually, as we've done this molecular pathway, we sort of had evidence of involvement of downstream of AMPA receptors. Um, you block these NMDA receptors, you trigger a cascade that then results in AMPA receptors, which usually mean plasticity in the brain. 
our data has really suggested that the hippocampus is the site, a brain region in the brain, the site of the initiation of antidepressant responses. So we actually looked by using electrophysiology at neuronal function, and we could see this enhancement of plasticity, this novel form of plasticity. And we only see it with, you know, for example, ketamine that has rapid antidepressant effects. If we look at another drug, say like memantine, which also blocks the same NMDA receptor, but does it with a different pathway, we don't see this plasticity and we also don't see antidepressant effects. And so we've really focused in that there's a true specificity of how you block this receptor to trigger a particular pathway to get to this plasticity. So the question is this plasticity, what is it good for? And that's what we're trying to investigate. What is it good for? And do you need this plasticity for the longer term effects? And so in the recent work that we've done, we've started to explore this. And so we went back to sort of the molecular characterization, like what genes, what is sort of that pathway is necessary to trigger an antidepressant effect in a long term. And we've identified um, a molecule that's a transcription factor. It just means it turns on other genes. It's involved downstream. So if you delete this gene, ketamine still has rapid antidepressant effects, but you lose the long-term effects. And so that's interesting. So we said, well, what happens with this plasticity? Again, if you delete this gene, ketamine still triggers this plasticity, but you don't see these long-term effects. And I think one of the more interesting findings that we found rather unexpectedly is that in patients, while ketamine can have rapid antidepressant effects, and in some patients can last for days, maybe even out for more than a week, at some point you're going to lose that antidepressant response. So the question is, how do you go about extending it. And so you can give maybe another dose of ketamine. You're not going to do it you know, every day, but how do you space it out to have the therapeutic effects without potential side effects? And what we did is we did um, a paradigm that's been used in the clinic where you give ketamine and then a week later you give another dose to see what happens. And when you do that, we can show that again, preclinically in animals that we can see an antidepressant effect, a longer term effect, we can maintain it. And we can show that we've extended the signaling pathway and the engagement and the importance of it for the long-term effects. But what's I think truly remarkable is that when we look at this plasticity, this plasticity that's important for the rapid antidepressant effects, it doesn't last forever. What's interesting though, is that when you give ketamine initially, you get this response and then with time it goes away and it's probably other brain regions are engaged as plasticity is happening in the brain. But when you give the repeated ketamine, the second dose of ketamine, you re-engage that process and this plasticity becomes even better. And that's quite remarkable because it's been noted clinically that uh, repeated ketamine appears to nearly have cumulative effects. It's not that you are you know, desensitizing or no longer responding, but if anything, it seems to get better. So we think that this plasticity may be sort of a cellular model, if you will, of what an antidepressant response is, a rapid antidepressant response. You have to engage this plasticity, and then you, with repeated ketamine to maintain the antidepressant effects, you continue to re-engage it. And so um, it's been exciting and an interesting project to think about what an antidepressant response looks like, a testable hypothesis molecularly that coincides with this functional changes that seem to be required for the antidepressant effect. And so I think it leaves a couple questions like by identifying this plasticity, if you could trigger this plasticity in a different way, maybe not with ketamine, but are there other drugs that could trigger this plasticity? And if so, would they have rapid antidepressant effects? And thinking about, you know, perhaps people that don't respond to antidepressants, not all individuals respond to ketamine, but perhaps those that don't, maybe they have, um, mutations or polymorphism in the genes that are in the pathway and that they can't trigger this plasticity. So we're trying to really further understand, again, ketamine and the molecular and plastic effects to understand rapid effects. But our ultimate goal is to use this information and to see then, can we go back to typical antidepressants and see if there's a point of convergence? Typical serotonin antidepressants aren't going to work through glutamate. But is there a point of convergence such that with an SSRI 
such as Wellbutner or Pro Prozac, it works in a molecular way that we don't understand and comes to a point where ketamine works in a different way faster, but you need a point of convergence to generate an antidepressant response. Is it this plasticity or is it perhaps a particular gene? So that's our work in 10 minutes. Uh, yes, exactly. In less than 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Lisa. Now, uh, that's the end of this installment of Teach Me in 10. But if you'd like to learn more about Lisa's research, we'll link, uh, if you don't mind, Lisa, a link to her lab's website and some more of her research in the show notes. So please do check that out if you'd like to learn more. But until our next installment of Teach Me in 10, that's all from us. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you.